My name is Dora Maoku. I welcome you to the Dream Big series. This program gives us young people the opportunity to meet key personalities who have achieved success and ask them to share their stories with us. The Dream Big series inspires us to work hard to also become achievers. This week, the Dream Big series takes us to the central region of Ghana to meet a special person who is an activist. His name is Mr. James Kofiana and he's the president of Challenging Heights. Mr. Annan's office is in this building. Please come with me to meet Mr. James Kofi Annan and find from him what Challenging Night is all about. We are very grateful to you for agreeing to speak to us. My name is Joama Oko and sir, what is Challenging Heights all about? Challenging Heights is an organization that I started um, some 10 years ago, uh, basically to seek the protection of children and their education. We are looking at what are issues that um, militate against the progress of children, the protection of children, that does not allow them to go to school. How do you provide solution for those issues? So in our case, some of the issues that we have identified are child trafficking that prevent children from going to school, that prevent children from being protected. We also identify poverty, family poverty as one of them. So a lot of parents do not have the means to take care of their children and therefore tend to sell their children to slavery and trafficking. So what we do is basically to look at how do we solve this problem with these families. We do that through giving them some economic opportunities and income for themselves and they'll be able to take care of their children. Okay. We also solve the problem of trafficking by rescuing some children, doing a program of rehabilitation, now a rehabilitation center, and taking them to school. We also do a lot of work to prevent more children from being forced into trafficking or child labor. By that, we identify vulnerable children. And vulnerable children are children who come from uh, homes where some of the children have been trafficked, homes where poverty is high, homes where the parents have given birth to so many children they cannot afford to take care of, okay. homes where there are conflicts. These are children who are vulnerable. We support these children in school. So that whilst they are in school, the school serves as protection for them from being trafficked. Please tell us what drives you. I'm driven by some innate motivation that strength that comes within that sometimes i do not um, find words to explain it's very strong within me now i am the last born of 12 children of my mother and all my 11 siblings never went to school i'm the only person who went to school at the age of six i was also sold into trafficking and i work for 17 hours a day on the average and you know, finally escaped after a cumulative period of seven years and got education. I mean, I went to school at a time when I could not write A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, when I was 13 years old. Struggled through school, came home to a parent, a father who rejected me, a mother who was happy to take care of me, but they didn't have the means. So I had to struggle by plugging coconut, splitting firewood, weeding, going for fishing, Combined it with my schooling. And despite all these struggles, I was able to get education. Now I have a master's degree. And I'm sure by the end of next month, you have to call me a doctor because I'm getting <laughs> a doctorate. After the university, I, I gained a job with Barclays Bank of Ghana, rose up to become a manager. Knowing what it means to be abused and what it means to be free and get education, I stand at a very strategic position to be able to advocate for those children who are still enslaved. So whatever I do, if a child doesn't go to school, I don't get fulfillment. Who are your parents and where were you born? My parents are both late. My mother um, is a traditional woman who was a fish, fishmonger um, and doing some farming alongside and trading. She was an inspiration to me, honestly, though she was illiterate. Uh, my dad was an illiterate uh, farmer, and uh, between the two of them, they had um, 12 children. My dad is the fourth son of 
eight children of his mother. And that's why I got my name, Anna. How was it like for you growing up? Which schools did you attend? It was a mixture of excitement, pain, and I would say later became like hopeful. I grew up in this community called Sanko in Winneba. I attended schools around. Um, I went to Winneba Secondary School and then went to the University of Ghana for my first degree. And I went to the uh, University of Education for my second master's degree. Uh, my childhood was truncated, you know, was more or less suspended when the issue of child labor came in and I had to stop school. Like, I had to leave my community and become an adult. It's like, I was a child, all right, but I was transformed into an adult, working from when I was six years old so when I was um, 13 years old. So that, that break, community break, um, deprived me of being a child. So I didn't have the opportunity to play um, because I was working. I didn't have the opportunity to have toys or and do the things that children would like to do and to have fun. No, I was always the serious person, was always a career person as a child, working typically starting from 3 a.m. and ending at 8 p.m. When I was supposed to have my childhood back, when I came at the age of 13, um, I was faced with this stark illiteracy, with poverty, and at the same time, my uh, motivation, desire to go to school. When my other friends were playing, I had to look for food or learning to catch up because at the age of okay. 13 i was put in class six because of the way i look i look very boisterous i look very strong everybody thought that i was going to abuse the other children in the lower classes if they put me there so because i was forcing them to admit me they put me in classes so that if i can't cope with it i can i will just drop out as a child what did you dream about and in what ways did any of those dreams lead you here beginning i didn't have a dream uh, my biggest dream was be one of them was to become a carpenter as a growing up child so, because that's, that's the biggest profession I saw in my community. Then that changed to becoming um, a fisherman because I saw that the fishermen were having um, a lot of houses and also they you know, they will be sitting there in their lazy chairs and then food will be served and they don't have to, even when they want a spoon, they will call somebody to bring them the spoon. So it was a luxury thing that I saw that, okay, I can also have it. Somehow, that changed after I, you know, I finally escaped to come and start schooling. Because then I was exposed to um, so many other things. Um, got to know that there are other options like um, there are teachers, there are lawyers, there are journalists, uh, there are engineers. There are so many options were available. And I saw myself doing well in school. I, in fact, the school I attended, I set a record there. That record is still there unbroken. So I was doing very well in school. So my ambition changed to wanting to become, um, you know, I started by saying I wanted to become a banker, you know, and, and fortunately I became a banker. And then um, I, if I said, I said, if I didn't become a banker, I wanted to become um, a, a big businessman, a doctor, and then journalist. At one time, I wanted to become a journalist. But all of them, um, I, I, I focus on my studies. Eventually, becoming a banker became a chance. Then, whilst I was working um, in the bank, I decided that that's not my area. After five years, I quit, and I started this job. Somehow, I've done the communication. Somehow, I've written a lot of articles. I didn't become a journalist, per se, but I've written a lot that is in line with the journalism. I love the faith you have and still have. Oh, yeah. Who is an activist? Yes. You are an activist. <laughs> an activist is anyone who would like to highlight the plights of the vulnerable 
and to seek solution from those who must provide solutions. Okay. So usually, an activist might not be necessarily the person to provide the answers to the questions that he's asking, but he's asking the questions to other people who must provide the solutions and the answers. An activist is somebody who has a conviction and will do everything possible to follow the conviction. And those kind of people, they hardly sway away from their conviction. They, they usually will suffer a lot of tribulations, a lot of um, attacks from their activism. But they will still stick to their conviction and say that this is what I believe in. And they will do everything possible through meeting with um, DG parents, those who must provide solutions, who must do something about the issue, through going to um, high places, through press conferences, through community mobilization, and urging the community to take action. Through various advocacy means, the activist will want to highlight his convention and why there must be a solution. And an activist must believe that, or must know that, his or her activism will end him a lot of criticism. But at the same time, in the end, if he sticks to his convention, he becomes a hero. What are the challenges you face as an activist, and how do you deal with them? I face a lot of death threats, you know, a lot of death threats. In fact, I face a lot of smear campaigns, people who would like to do everything possible to bring me down and bring my work down. It's been 10 years of enduring a lot of challenges, a lot of um, um, things that should cause me to actually resign. So how I've dealt with the challenges has to do with my conviction about my belief in what I'm doing. The other challenges, like not having enough resources to do what you're doing, um, is, is something that um, everyone faces. I mean, both financial and human resource, material resource. And the danger is that if you start something and you don't complete it, you have more problems. So you need to think ahead, be innovative, I'm fortunate to have met a lot of people who come on board. Um, in my life, I've met the lives of um, um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, President Clinton, um, you know, Queen of uh, Sweden. It all comes with some support. Even if it is not the material support I'm talking about, it gives you visibility. And that visibility then brings in other things. Okay. And I take advantage of meeting those big, big, big actors in the world and, and use them as opportunity to address the challenges that I face. What does working to save humanity mean to you? I love that word humanity and I admire you for you know, applying that word. At least you just mentioning it inspires me and I really appreciate that. Um, it, it means a lot. It means life. You see, working to save humanity means life itself. Anytime I rescue a child or my organization rescues a child, I feel I've rescued myself. It means a lot to me because then I would have saved myself. Never should we allow people, some citizens of our world, to go through such a loss situation, such inhuman environment, whilst others have it in, in opulence. Especially in my travels, I've gone to homes where there's a special accommodation, well furnished for the dog in the house. Somebody is looking for 0.0001% of that just to survive. He's not going to get it. There's no way that person is going to get it. That person who has created that wealth deserves it because he worked for it. 
He deserved it. Is there any way that we can reach on us some, just a small of that resource to make life a little bit easy for those who do not have? That is the question that humanity would have to answer. Remember, you go to some gold mining areas, they are sitting right on the gold. That is their land, the land of their birth. And yet they live in poverty. Those who mine the gold are living in luxury. People are living in the forest areas. That is their land, their native land. And this timber is cut and shaped like people are buying, riding in big posh cars. And those whose resources are being cut do not even, cannot meet, even have two square meals a day, cannot send your children to school. That is what I'm talking about. Humanity, that is what it means to me. How and where do you find inspiration? I find inspiration from you. How? Oh yeah, you, we are sitting down having a chat. I wish when I was a child, I could sit down with an adult to have a chat. I didn't. And, you know, those were the days when having a chat, a conversation like this, with an adult was an insult, was a disrespect to the adult. Today, we see that to, for children to have the confidence to develop to their utmost, they need to be given the atmosphere to grow with adults, to be free. You inspire me by asking me these questions at tempo, and I admire you for that. And I'm telling you, I'm very honest with what I'm saying. The children that I've rescued in the past, we have rescued more than 1,200 children, you know, in the last 10 years from slavery. The children that we support to go to school, several hundreds of them, anytime I see them, and the way they are happy, the way they have been able to triumph over their past, and now becoming very, very useful adults. We graduated our first batch of um, students from our school this year, and they had very fantastic schools to go to. Anytime I see them, I get inspired. You are in a public school. It is said that the public schools are not doing well, even compared to their confidence level. Can't you sit with me and ask me questions? The audacity to ask me the questions. I like it. Okay, which book do you read and why? I like reading Professor Kwesi Yanka, um, who used to write in the mirror, um, The Woes of uh, Quetrot. He compiled his writings into a book, which is very good. I, I like reading it because it's satirical, it chronicles, you know, serious issues transform into humorous situations where you can read and relax. You know, things for our past, the beautiful ones are not yet born, the, uh, and the like. You know, I like I love reading them. But beyond that, as I said, um, I love reading the laws that govern the work I do. So the Children's Act, the Human Trafficking Act, the Human Justice Act, all those acts, the Domestic Violence Act, I read them you know, a lot. I make reference to them. And also um, the Constitution of Ghana, I read it a lot. You know, the provisions that, especially the provisions that governs um, children and education and all of that. I also read policies, so almost every policy that uh, concerns my work, I read them. Who has influenced you the most? My mom influenced me the most, though um, we didn't live a lot together. Oh, um, she, her influence was on very little things, like she was always talking about um, how she was not happy that her children did not go to school, 12 children. And so she was always hoping that I would go to school, but she didn't know how. So I walk from here to uh, Winneba Secondary School, you know, it's a very long distance, but I, I couldn't afford boarding her, so I was from the house going to school. I came home hoping that my mom would have gotten something for, for me to eat. She saw me and she started crying. I saw tears and I was asking, what, what, why? She didn't answer me. And then she said I should go to her room and uh, just take off the pillow. There was some money there. 
I should take it for food. Then I wanted to find out more. She said she had not eaten since morning. She was very hungry. And she didn't have any food to eat. I said, but you just told me I should go and take money to go and find food to eat. She said, yes, because if I use that money to buy the food to eat, it meant that today you are not going to be able to eat. That was very deep. So now, I've, I regret that she, she didn't live long enough to get anything from me. And it's still something that makes me, anytime I remember it, I want to do more to compensate her for that singular gesture. Have you received any awards for rescuing children? I've received so far 11 international awards. Won the Frederick Douglass Freedom Award, won the um, Grenell Young Innovator for Social Justice Prize. Um, I've won the World Association of NGOs Education Award. I've won the Rate for Change Change Leaders Award. Um, I've won the C10 Award, that Child 10 Award, which was given me uh, through the Queen of Sweden. I've also won the World Children's Prize. Children around the world came together to vote, and over 2.2 million children voted around the world. And I became the ultimate winner of that prize. That is the only uh, award prize that is sitting on my table because it was given to me by children. Please describe in one brief sentence how you imagine a better world for children. Better world for children is a world where every child will grow up in a home environment with adult care, able and capable of going to school, assured of at least completing a basic education, guaranteed good food, at least three square meal a day, environment for play, and hopeful that they will develop into good adulthood. Could you please tell us a story that has made an impact on you? I have one child who inspires me a lot. Um, He's a child that I rescued a few years ago who um, did not, had no education and was abused constantly and um, we rescued him and now he's top in his class. At the time we were rescuing him, he looked very, very dirty. He looked very tortured. He looked like there's vengeance in his eyes. His eyes were jaundiced, had a lot of marks all over him. He was not, he was not interested in talking about himself. And now he's somebody who is top in his class and leader in his community. That is very inspirational. This platform that you have given me to speak is a platform that the children have given me. If I didn't do anything about the situation of these children, I don't think I'll have all this platform to be put in the international stage to speak and all of that. Just this weekend, I'm going to Rome to meet the Pope. All about because of the children, talking about issues of children. That is a very important inspiration for my work and for me, you know. So children are always the ones that put a smile on my face. Wow, you've given us real food for thought. We are very grateful to you for agreeing to speak to us and taking us through the challenging world of challenging heights. Mr. Nafo, Thank you very us. much for having me. You're welcome. I am Dora Maoko, and until I meet you same time next week on the Dream Big series, let us remember to dream big. Bye.